Welcome everyone. Uh, thank you again uh, for joining us. My name is Paloma Racco. I'm a faculty at the School of Public Policy and Administration at Carleton University and one of the founding board members of Whistleblowing Canada. Uh, found, founded in uh, 2019, Whistleblowing Canada is a registered charity. The organization's purpose is to advance education on whistleblowing by conducting research on the whistleblowing phenomenon and culture in Canada. Uh, we capture existing knowledge, discovering new knowledge and sharing this information through seminars, conference, training for the interested general public as well for employees, whistleblowers and leaders in Canadian public and private organizations. As a, new, as a newly registered charity, Whistleblowing Canada relies on public support to expand its activities. If you are so inclined, you can donate um, to the organizations via our website. Your presence and interest mean a lot to us. Today, I have the privilege of hosting um, the webinar titled The Expansion of Whistleblower Reward Programs in the US, Canada, and Globally, How Whistleblowers Assist Government Prosecutors and Enforcement Attorneys in Rooting Out Fraud. Today's talk is presented by Mary Inman, Shafali Joshi Clark, and moderated by David Yasbeck. Yasbeck. Mary Inman is a partner in Constantine Cannon's San Francisco and London offices and the head of the firm's international whistleblower practice. After more than 20 years representing whistleblowers in the US, she moved to London in July 2017 to launch the firm's international whistleblower practice. She specializes in representing whistleblowers from the UK, Europe, and worldwide under the various American whistleblower programs. Shafali Joshi Clark is a senior forensic accountant in the office of the whistleblower of the Ontario Securities Commission. Um, she was a key member in the development of the OSC whistleblower program. Since the program's launch in 2016, Shafali deals directly with whistleblowers and reviews their tip, corresponds with OSC staff assigned to investigate whistleblower tips, and responds to public inquiries about the whistleblower program. David Yazbek practices as an advocate for union and unions, employees, and human rights complainants in the area of labor relations, human rights, judicial reviews and appeals, and charter lit litigations with an emphasis on the federal public sector. He has particular expertise in employee free speech, whistleblowing, and anti-reprisal complaints. So our speaker today will talk about 30 minutes. During that time, I will be muting everyone. So you've noticed that you're all mute um, in case people join us during the talk. As you may notice in the Zoom age, sometimes people don't realize they're unmuted. So uh, just to make it easy, we have muted everyone, but you're able to unmute yourself. After the presentation, David will open the, the session for a conversation. As we all know, whistleblowing is a complex and very personal issue for some. I would kindly ask you to ask, if possible, succinct questions and that you are mindful that other people might want to talk as well. Um, please keep your intervention respectful and short. Um, as a side note, we might, you know, this, this happens again, unfortunately, we are in the age of Zoom bombing, whether it's my toddler, for those who were there last week, or uh, the, the wider internet. Um, if something were to happen more serious, I will stop the webinar and I would invite everyone to log back in again. I will just stop the session. Um, at this point, I invite David, our moderator, to take the helm. We will be recording the session and make the recording uh, the recording available afterwards. So thank you. David. Thank you so much, Paloma, for the introduction. Uh, my name is David Yazbek. Uh, heads up, I could be uh, Zoom bombed by my cat. 
but it, it, she's very non-threatening. Um, and she has a slight interest in, in whistleblower law as well, uh, which I do. I'm also, for the audience, I'm also a member of the advisory board for uh, this research society. It's my privilege to be part of that. And I'm really, really happy to be here today with two wonderful speakers, uh, Shafali and Mary, who have uh, some amazing uh, expertise and experience in this area. So it's going to be a really great panel. Um, I did want to remind everybody of something that Paloma already said, which is that uh, we all recognize that the whole subject matter of whistleblowing is it's a very complex and often personal issue. As, as a lawyer who represents a lot of whistleblowers, I have seen that. Uh, I, I can't say I know exactly how it feels, but I know it can be uh, uh, difficult and overwhelming. So we're cognizant of that, but please be cautious with your, your comments. Uh, try to keep them short and respectful, et cetera. And be aware that there are plenty of people on the call today or on, in the webinar who may want to participate as well. So we want to make sure that everybody has an opportunity to do that. Um, so uh, we'll move right into the session here, and um, I'll ask uh, Mary or Shafali to start with their respective perspectives. And as I said, once we go through that, we will have an opportunity for you in the audience to ask questions. So please hold back on your questions until we reach that point. Uh, there are also going to be a couple of polls. So we're going to ask you for your input and um, basically respond to a question and then we'll report the results uh, later in the session. So thanks all, enjoy, and uh, I'll turn it over to our speakers. Thank you, David, appreciate um, having the opportunity. Thank you, Paloma and Pamela and Shaifali for taking the time out. I also want to um, make clear that I'm also an advisory board member of Whistleblowing Canada Research Society. So it's my great pleasure to be here in two capacities and I really, we welcome the opportunity to advance the discussions on this. So as a primer, I should say that the discussion we're about to have, at least based on my experience of three and a half years in living in the UK, is one that generates some very strong reactions. So we welcome the debate here. I think the idea about whether whistleblowers should be paid for their information um, sometimes can be seen as a foreign or challenging concept. In fact, um, in yesterday's Canadian paper, The Conversation, we actually had a, I, I'm hoping it was generated by this, that we move the conversation forward, but um, had a detractor write a, an interesting op-ed, so we can certainly talk about that. So before I dive in, I'm going to give you a whistle-stop tour of the American whistleblower programs and then their expansion internationally. I'm going to do that in 15 minutes or less and then turn it over to Shai Folly. But before we do that, we want to take a baseline reading um, with this poll to see what people's reaction before we speak to you um, about what you think about whistleblower rewards. So if you would participate, thank you. All right, can people see my screen? Okay. So I'm going to talk just a little bit about the way the reward programs have worked in the United States. Um, so to begin, let me see if I can advance my slides here. Um, what is a whistleblower reward program? So it is basically, um, I think people, when they hear about whistleblower and whistleblower protections, there's a presumption and an assumption that it deals with retaliation or reprisal protection, protection against reprisals. And while that's a really important component of protecting whistleblowers, the reward programs, I, I would um, attest, are really there to empower whistleblowers. So basically, it's not to protect the whistleblower retrospectively, but actually proactively, the information that they're blowing the whistle about, the whistle about is something they can bring to a government agency. Um, certain government agencies who pay the whistleblower a percentage of any fine that they impose as a result of that information. So it's basically a way for that whistleblower to get their concern to to the regulator who can actually act upon it. So that is what we're talking about here today. And I see that less as, um, and, and, and retaliation protections, reprisal protections are very important. But for right now, I'm just talking about those programs where we have a pairing of whistleblowers who have information with the agencies who can act upon them. So I want to start very, very fundamentally with who are the whistleblowers that can bring information to government agencies and receive um, financial compensation. Um, it, obviously, we start at the heart with insiders. Um, that is 
to us, the, the sine qua non of these programs is that there's no substitute for an insider at a corporation that is cheating a government agency or cheating the government in a government program. They can provide prosecutors to a with a roadmap to the fraud that is very difficult. Um, to, it's unparalleled in terms of the amount of um, helpful information that they can get to a government authority. Think about a busy prosecutor or enforcement attorney like um, folks in Shaifali's office at the OSC who are inundated. They are always going to pick up a file where a whistleblower insider basically brings them cake in a box. All they have to do is add water. They basically from the inside can say that this was something that is very difficult from audit for auditors from the outside to detect. So the classic whistleblower insider is seen as the most valuable, but what's been fascinating to me over my 23 years in this career, in this career space, is that the as these programs have expanded and as we become more knowledgeable about whistleblowers, um, we've actually, the evolution has become such that we are expanding the definition of who can be a whistleblower. So um, we're starting to see outsiders, whistleblower outsiders and competitors. They are also people who are, have very interesting information that can again tip an agency off to um, frauds or wrongdoing that's occurring. So a competitor has intimate knowledge of their space and they may know that how is it possible that our competitor is making these kind of returns on a particular, why can't I compete? And they are often able to detect what is going on and bring that information forward. So I think it's important to recognize it's not just insiders. Um, we've expanded our definition to include outsiders. In fact, the SEC, and I know it's American alphabet soup here, our securities uh, regulators called the Securities and Exchange Commission, their whistleblower program was born out of and inspired by a whistleblower outsider. So uh, it came into effect in, after the financial crisis in the Dodd-Frank um, legislation. And the whistleblower who inspired the program is a guy named Harry Markopoulos. There's an amazing documentary about him, books about him, but he was a financial advisor in Boston who was advising his clients about Bernie Madoff's offerings and had determined that it was statistically impossible to get the returns he was suggesting. And so he brought the information to the SEC's office in Boston three times and was basically ignored. And it was really that idea that although he wasn't an insider at Madoff's companies, um, he was an outsider, but he tipped off the American government. The American government, the SEC, didn't listen. And so that's why we created the SEC whistleblower program under Dodd-Frank and said there will now and forevermore be a whistleblower office that basically signals to whistleblowers, you can come to us to the office of the whistleblower, submit a tip, and if that information moves us to open an investigation and hopefully impose a fine, then the whistleblower can get 10 to 30% of that award. So just trying to give you the concept that when people think about whistleblowers, they think about insiders. We think it's a broader, it's much broader church than that. Um, interesting, when you think about whistleblowers, we only want people who, there's a presumption uh, that we only want people who come with clean hands. Um, that is also not the case. Um, we don't want people who are the architects of the fraud to bring our information forward, but in a way it's irrelevant what their motivations are. Um, under the original whistleblower statute in the United States, um, which is called Lincoln's Law, and it was the Federal False Claims Act, there's a concept of it takes a rogue to catch a rogue. So often, people in the most compromised positions have the most valuable information. So I want to challenge some perceptions here that do we only want to um, welcome people who have uh, are morally righteous in bringing their information forward. My view, and it's shared by the programs, is that as long as the information you bring is corroborated um, and can be born to be true, then it's irrelevant what your motivations are. Again, up to the point of as long as you did it, you can't create a fraud and then therefore benefit, benefit from it and get a receiver reward. But as long as you are able to point a finger upwards that it was, you, you can certainly be a co-conspirator. You can be part of the fraud um, and it doesn't preclude you under the American programs from speaking forward. The last piece on who can be a whistleblower, and I think most importantly to my career journey, has been international whistleblowers. Um, you don't have to be an American to bring information to the United States government. In fact, and we'll show you some statistics in a moment, um, there's an increase 
a, a steady increase in the number of folks outside the United States who are contributing tips um, and receiving rewards under the American programs. And in fact, that is what inspired my move to the United Kingdom. Um, because the data that we see coming out of the SEC program, which I'll show you in a moment, has shown that year over year, the United Kingdom, and I think because of the financial services sector presence in London, has been the number one country outside the United States supplying tips. In the last two years, they've been eclipsed by Canada. Um, so I'll show you those data, that data, and I actually think, and this is my layperson's speculation, that it's the rise of Shai Fali's Ontario Securities Commission program that has allowed the Canadians to surpass um, the Brits in bringing information to us. But I think all of this is intuitive, right? We live in a, in a global world with multinational corporations and global business. And so as long as we can show a nexus to the United States, as long as um, the SEC, the Securities Commission has um, jurisdiction and it can extend beyond just listed companies that can go to companies traded over the counter or regulated entities, then we can um, and do bring cases against overseas um, operators. All right, so really quickly, because I'm mindful of time, um, we here's a, just a quick overview of all the programs that we have in the United States. I obviously each one of these could serve for their own uh, discussion, but I'm just going to talk to you very quickly that there are actually five. So the grandfather of our programs, as I alluded to earlier, is Lincoln's Law. It's called the False Claims Act. It's enforced by the Depart U.S. Department of Justice, and it is really a procurement fraud um, vehicle. It is unique in that it allows whistleblowers to do more than just submit tips, which is what we're gonna hear that the OSC's program does and these agency programs do, actually allows a, a whistleblower to file a lawsuit in the name of the government. Um, so the whistleblowers are actually parties to the action and the types of frauds that they expose are anywhere where there's US taxpayer dollars. So if there's defense contracting fraud, Medicare, Medicaid fraud, those are where you're submitting false information to the United States government or one of their prime contractors in order to get paid. Um, that is what these programs seek to address. The reason I talk about this here, even though Canada doesn't have that program yet, um, is that it is the inspiration for all of our subsequent whistleblower reward programs. So the success, and I'll show you some data of the False Claims Act is what spawned and incentivized the, all of these agencies, the SEC, the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, our Internal Revenue Service to do the same. They sort of got jealous and said, wow, this is incredible. The Department of Justice said their number one enforcement tool is whistleblowers. It has helped them bring cases in unparalleled numbers and unlock um, cases and, and impose fines and open prosecutions that they never would have been able to otherwise. So I think there is a notion to the SEC and the IRS and the CFTC, we should get in on this game. And um, we think it's really important that whistleblowers are super helpful in helping us um, launch investigations and point us in the right direction. So they have all, all of these folks over here have put into what we put into place, what we call agency programs, which means tips. They're allowing whistleblowers not to launch the lawsuits or start an enforcement ag action, but to actually file a tip with the agency. And if it spurs on an investigation and into a fine or penalty, the whistleblower can receive a percentage. So the success of the SEC's program in turn, um, and we'll give you those data, that data in a minute, um, has actually spawned this beginning of this year, yet one more program in the United States, which is on January 1st, the Treasury Department, as a result of the ICIJ, International Consortium of Invest Investigative Journalists, um, uh, research and their expose into the FinCEN files um, and leaks, there was an, uh, a program adopted on the Anti-Money Laundering Act that now allows whistleblowers to bring information to the Treasury Department if they know about violations of the United States Bank Secrecy Act, which is really an anti-money laundering statute. So a lot of what we're, being, we're seeing now with kleptocracy, oligarchs, all of it, people moving monies and cleaning monies in extraordinary ways, we now see that the Treasury Department has decided they want to open up the whistleblower tool as well. So that's brand new. Um, this is a concept, uh, this, the, the key TAM statutes that we use in false claims, something we stole from English common law. So this is a commonwealth, uh, common law type of concept, um, and we have co-opted it in the United States. So as I was telling you, under the False Claims Act, the, the federal government protects its federal taxpayer dollars under a federal False Claims Act. But I wanted folks to know that in addition to the federal 
False Claims Act, there are 31 states and eight localities who have adopted similar whistleblower programs to protect their treasury. So any procurement fraud that's happening in the state of California um, or in municipalities in California, whistleblowers can launch lawsuits in the government's name and get 10 to 30 percent. Um, so now, just very quickly, talk to you a little bit about the SEC program. The SEC program is welcoming people who have information about violations of the U.S. securities law. Um, and in addition, one of those securities laws, uh, that one of the laws that the SEC has jurisdiction over is the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. So it extends beyond just securities laws, but to any bribery of government officials, whistleblowers can and do assist in those programs. Um, just, I won't go through the whole process. This comes from the SEC's website on how you can submit a tip. They walk you step by step. But I think what's most significant here is in green, which is that the monies that go to pay the whistleblowers do not come out of um, the funds that are given to the harmed investors. It's a separate pool of money. And I think that's really important um, to, to recognize. Um, here are some of the violations that uh, the SEC welcomes whistleblowers to tell them about. So typical accounting fraud, uh, you know, insider uh, trading, dark pools, a lot of the stuff that um, I think are probably bread and butter for, for Shai Fali's office. These are the sorts of um, violations that the SEC is welcoming and, and that, that whistleblowers like our clients have brought forward. Talk to you a little bit about the FCPA. The FCPA, Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, has consistently been an area where the SEC has imposed some of its biggest fines and the SEC in conjunction with the Department of Justice. So these are just some of the really big numbers here that the penalties that have been imposed on these companies for bribing. Um, now turning really quickly to the advent, like I said, of this new uh, a trend of international whistleblowers being our allies here. Um, this is from the 2019 report. 15 of their whistleblower award recipients in 2019 came from uh, overseas. So this is data that I've taken from the SEC program is 10 years old. Um, and they do an annual report, the SEC's whistleblower office to Congress, where they track the countries of origin from which they're receiving tips. And so this is our year over year numbers um, that are showing the UK and now Canada um, being a regular contributor to these programs. In fact, the SEC's program says they receive tips from 100, over 130 countries from around the world. These are just the top countries. <clears throat> so the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, it is our um, regulator for the commodities, futures, derivatives market. So it mirrors the SEC program. I won't spend much time on that, but similarly, they give whistleblowers 10 to 30% of any fine the CFTC imposes. Similar violations here that um, whistleblowers can alert them to, Ponzi schemes, misappropriations of funds, um, registration violations. And one thing I want to pause on, because um, this is remarkable to me, is that this is a picture I took in London of uh, representatives from the Office of the Whistleblower of the CSTC setting up a trade show booth seeking whistleblowers. This is how valuable whistleblowers are to the CFTC, that they don't just wait for lawyers like us or other um, whistleblowers to come to them, they actually go out and actively recruit. So they are sitting here at the International Derivatives Expo in London. Um, that's my timer. And uh, uh, telling us that they are that keen to, to, to see whistleblowers, um, that they give out lanyards and say, call our number. Um, so our IRS program is similar. And so now, so that I don't go over time, I'm just going to show you really quickly some of the figures here. So this is the returns that we've seen. So from the False Claims Act, this is what inspired the SEC. $62 billion has been collected between 1987 and 2019. Of that amount, $44 billion from whistleblower initiated action. So I'd like to show you these figures because whistleblowers have been say, paid $7 billion in rewards, but really that's 16% of the total. So I would surmise and say to folks that I think that's a good return on the on the government's uh, investment. Uh, similarly, here's some of the latest numbers from the SEC program. They've paid 143 individuals $759 million. Sounds like a lot of money, is a lot of money, but those whistleblowers have allowed them to get imposed fines in excess of $2 billion. Um, I will just quickly show the numbers for the CFTC program. Again, 120 million to 15 whistleblowers since 2014 when they started. 
Um, and here's the IRS programs numbers. So um, we don't have time to talk about many of the international programs, but they exist. These, this is, I'll end with this map that shows that it's not just an American notion. The idea of paying rewards to whistleblowers is um, reflected around the globe. Happy to talk in questions about what some of these other programs look like, but this is where I'm proud to turn it over to our neighbors to the north um, to talk about the Ontario Security Commission's program. Um, and before we turn it to Shaifali, I will say that in addition to Shaifali's program, the Canada Revenue Agency has a whistleblower reward program also. It's called the Offshore Tax Informant Program, where they it's mandatory that they pay rewards to whistleblowers who are able to show that Canadians are hiding or evading their taxes overseas. So with that bit of global perspective, um, I turn it over to Shaifali. Can everyone see my screen? Yes, perfect. And you can hear me clearly? Perfect. That sounds great. Great, okay, perfect. Um, okay, so let me just get myself started. Okay, so hello everyone. I hope you are all keeping safe and well. My name is Shafali Joshi Clark and I'm here from the Ontario Securities Commission's Office of the Whistleblower, which administers the OSC's whistleblower program. I want to start by thanking all of you for your time today and many thanks to the Whistleblowing Canada Research Society for having me. Here is our standard disclaimer. I want to point out that the views I express today are my own and do not necessarily reflect those of the Ontario Securities Commission and its staff. So in my presentation today, I want to first provide a brief overview of the OSC and our whistleblower program. Next, I will highlight the whistleblower protections and talk about our recent OSC case, which is the first enforcement matter involving a breach of the anti-reprisal provisions. And finally, I'll take you through some practical considerations on what this all means for you as potential whistleblowers and for Ontario's market participants. So let's start with some background information. The OSC is the regulatory agency responsible for overseeing the capital markets in Ontario. We administer and enforce the Ontario Securities Act and the Commodity Futures Act. We have a multi-pronged mandate, which is to uphold investor protection and to foster confidence and financial stability in the capital markets. We work to protect investors and fulfill our statutory mandate by making rules governing the securities industry, by monitoring compliance, and by enforcing the rules. In 2016, the OSC launched its whistleblower program. The purpose of our whistleblower program is to encourage individuals to report timely, specific, and credible information on securities misconduct in Ontario directly to the OSC's Office of the Whistleblower or to their employer's internal compliance systems. For those who report to the OSC, they may be eligible for an award of up to $5 million. You as potential whistleblowers play an essential role in exposing securities misconduct which may not otherwise come to our attention. You provide an invaluable service which allows the OSC to intervene swiftly and directly, achieving better outcomes for investors and our capital markets. Our program has now been running now for over four and a half years and it's having a significant impact on our enforcement investigations. We have received many tips from whistleblowers in provinces across the country and from several foreign countries. We've also received anonymous tips made through counsel from a number of different law firms. The OSC has issued over 8 million in whistleblower awards to multiple whistleblowers. For those of you who hold a senior role at your company, this program is an opportunity in that you can help your company in building up those compliance systems and to foster a culture that affirmatively encourages and empowers employees to report internally first without fear of reprisal. I encourage all of you to visit our website 
which is oscwhistleblower.ca, which has more information and also serves as the portal for online tips. Our whistleblower program is open to receiving tips on all types of securities misconduct in Ontario. We're particularly interested in whistleblower tips on those complex, hard to detect cases, such as, for example, misstatements and financial statements, misleading disclosure and public filings, illegal insider trading. These are just some of the examples of the types of misconduct that we're trying to target. We know that these types of cases typically involve sophisticated players, raise complex issues, and are difficult to detect without the assistance of whistleblowers. Under our program, we really encourage whistleblowers to provide information that is high quality in that it's timely, specific, and contains credible facts. So we're asking whistleblowers to provide information on who is involved, so the names of any entities or individuals, what happened. We ask that you provide us with specifics and details on the alleged misconduct and the timing of the misconduct. So identify whether the conduct occurred in the past, is ongoing or about to occur. For example, whistleblowers who alert us to securities misconduct that is imminent uh, can help the OSC stop the alleged misconduct in its track and help to prevent further investor losses. So the timeliness of a whistleblower's report is critical. With the whistleblower's information and assistance, we at the OSC want to jumpstart our enforcement investigations and move the needle forward so that we can conclude the investigations effectively and efficiently. This slide here provides a snapshot of the overall process from the filing of a whistleblower tip with the OSC's Office of the Whistleblower to the payment of a whistleblower award. So starting from the top, you will see a whistleblower, like Mary mentioned, a whistleblower can be one individual or a group of individuals acting jointly and can include uh, insiders, current or former employees, as well as external parties, such as independent analysts, contractors, and investors who are aware of securities misconduct in Ontario's capital markets. To submit a tip to our program, you must complete a designated form, which is available on the website of the OSC Whistleblower Program. You may submit your tip either uh, non-anonymously by identifying yourself to us, or you may submit it anonymously through a lawyer. Once you submit the tip, we in the Office of the Whistleblower review all whistleblower tips very carefully to determine if the tip warrants further review or investigation. If the whistleblower's tip provides meaningful assistance to OSC enforcement staff and results in OSC enforcement action with 1 million or more in monetary sanctions and or voluntary payments, the whistleblower may receive an award of up to $5 million. So in order to receive an award, there is a $1 million threshold that must be met in addition to other criteria. The award range is five to 15% of monetary sanctions imposed and or voluntary payments made. And this percentage is based on the specific factors that are set out in the OSC policy, OSC policy 15601, which is available on the website of the OSC. So the factors that are considered are things like timeliness of the whistleblower's report, the degree of assistance provided by the whistleblower, and the whistleblower's efforts, if any, to report the misconduct internally to their employer. These are just some examples of factors that are considered in determining the award percentage. I just want to be clear that not every whistleblower tip will result in a whistleblower re reward. There is, like I said, there is that $1 million threshold and there's eligibility criteria that must be met. And all of these are outlined in the OSC policy 15601. Let's now move, over, uh, move to whistleblower protections. The protection of a whistleblower's identity is a key feature of the OSC whistleblower program because it removes one of the principal impediments to a whistleblower who wishes to come forward but fears potential adverse consequences. 
our program provides robust protections for whistleblowers to facilitate the reporting of misconduct and to make people comfortable in coming forward. So the first protection is confidentiality. OSC staff use all reasonable efforts to protect the identity of the whistleblower. This is not a guarantee as disclosure may be required by law in certain circumstances. So for example, if the matter proceeds to in a section 127 administrative proceeding, disclosure is required to permit a respondent to make full answer and defense. And in that case, the whistleblower's identity may be revealed. For employee whistleblowers, the Ontario Securities Act was amended in three key areas. The first is anti-reprisals. It is a breach of the Ontario Securities Act to take a reprisal against an employee for whistleblowing. A reprisal is broadly defined to include any measure taken that adversely affects their employment. So for example, this can include things like terminating, demoting, disciplining, or even a threat to do so. This protection applies to those whistleblowers who report internally to their employer, as well as those who report directly to the OSC or a law enforcement agency. Second, employees who face reprisal for whistleblowing can now pursue a civil cause of action against their employer in the Superior Court. The burden of proof here rests on the employer to satisfy the court that they did not take a reprisal against an employee for whistleblowing, and there may be certain remedies available. Lastly, any provisions in employment agreements, confidentiality agreements, or other agreements that have the effect of silencing or restricting an employee from whistleblowing or preventing cooperation with a regulator and law enforcement those provisions are void. Next, I want to talk about a recent OSC case that you may have heard uh, last year in July. Uh, this relates to the settlement in the Coin Square matter. This case represents a milestone for the OSC in that it is the first action we have taken for a reprisal against an employee whistleblower since these important protections were added to Ontario securities legislation in 2016. By way of background, as part of the settlement, CoinSquare admitted to taking a reprisal against an internal whistleblower who reported concerns about inflated trading volumes to the company's senior management. The OSC released oral re reasons, which are interesting from our perspective, and um, I think there's some language in there that I, is relevant for our discussion. I have a few passages on the screen that I want to share with you. So according, in the oral reasons, it says, the protection against whistleblower reprisal is fundamental, and the commission expects that employees be free to raise concerns about potential breaches of Ontario securities law without fear of adverse impacts on their employment. The oral reasons also say, the individual respondents are being held accountable for their specific misconduct and the market is on notice that the commission will not tolerate deceptive conduct, reprisals against whistleblowers or failures to maintain compliance systems. All of this goes to show you just how seriously the OSC is taking the anti-reprisal provisions and that we will take enforcement actions against those employers who take reprisals against employee whistleblowers. For market participants operating in Ontario's capital markets, the OSC whistleblower program is an opportunity to review and enhance your internal compliance and reporting systems, and to foster a culture where the internal reporting of misconduct is encouraged without any fear of employee reprisal. We know that whistleblowers are a passionate group who want to stop the misconduct as soon as possible. And research shows that whistleblowers do want to report internally. We know from the SEC's whistleblower program that about 85% of employees who received an award under their program first raised their concerns internally to their employer before reporting to the SEC. 
And this is a truly, this is a truly cautionary tale. It just goes to show you that many of these employees did try to report internally to their company. And one of the main reasons why they went to the regulator was because of the inaction taken by those companies. As Mary po uh, pointed out, uh, Canadian whistleblowers have now submitted the most number of tips to the SEC's whistleblower program last year, other than tips submitted by U.S.-based whistleblowers. And this, so clearly, there's something that's motivating Canadians to report securities misconduct. We recognize that an organization's internal compliance program plays an extremely valuable role in protecting the integrity of and maintaining confidence in Ontario's capital markets. It's important to emphasize that the OSC whistleblower program incentivizes employee whistleblowers to report internally to their employer, such that reporting internally first or assisting in internal investigations are factors that may increase a potential whistleblower award whereas interference will, with those systems will surely decrease in award. We believe that our program has created a powerful incentive for companies to support uh, to self-report wrongdoing to the OSC. Companies now know that if they don't, the OSC is more likely than ever to learn of the misconduct through another channel, such as the OSC whistleblower program. Given the high level of interest shown by whistleblowers, it's important that organizations who participate in Ontario's capital markets take proactive steps to identify and respond swiftly to internal misconduct. There was a recent study that was put out uh, that demonstrated that companies that have strong internal reporting systems tend to have, among other things, greater profitability and fewer external whistleblower reports to regulators and prosecutors. On this slide, we have identified some key issues that companies may want to consider. So things like, is there a strong tone at the top that values and supports internal whistleblowers? In terms of the board's involvement, uh, companies should consider whether the director's level of engagement and the types of questions being asked are appropriate. It, you know, it goes without saying that the focus should be on investigating the misconduct should an employee report, uh, should an employee blow the whistle internally, rather than the company trying to figure out who blew the whistle. Thank you, Shafali. Um, are you, do, do you have anything else to add or are we going to simply wait the outcome of the poll right now? Sure, I can, I can conclude uh, my presentation and then we can look at the results. Sure, and I think Mary will have a question too, so we can touch on that as well. Yeah, I, I thank you, David. I wanted to see if we could pull up my polling question again and see if we have persuaded you at all by the information we've provided you. So asking you to answer the same question as you answered at the start, if you could try and answer it again now and see if we have any different results. So according to the results here, it looks like that the uh, main obstacle which prevents you from speaking up and reporting the wrongdoing um, for the majority of you is risk on my future career prospects and or professional risks. Uh, we certainly recognize this, that um, the decision to speak up and report any wrongdoing um, takes a lot of courage and it's not an easy decision. Um, we also want to point out that the financial incentive piece that we have built in into our program is a critical piece uh, which recognizes the risks that whistleblowers may take to report the misconduct. And as well under the OSC whistleblower program, our confidentiality and whistleblower protections are there to protect whistleblowers from reporting. On this last slide, we've just outlined some key resources that may be of interest to you. I encourage all of you to visit the website of um, our whistleblower program. So that's oscwhistleblower.ca, which has lots of useful information on the OSC's whistleblower program. And this site also serves as the online portal for submitting tips. Thank you so much, uh, Shafali. And I, I note that as a result of your poll, the, the second uh, most responded to uh, 
response was fear of retaliation from my employer at 35%. So in, in a sense, both of those categories are forms of reprisal, whether there's a risk of career process, process or prospects and then retaliation in general. So it's interesting that a significant proportion, uh, 75% fear some sort of negative response, uh, which is something that we all deal with on, on a regular basis. Um, and then Mary, I, I, are, are we getting some responses on your poll now? Um, Paloma, can you do, so that was before, that's our before, can we do a snapshot for after? Can we ask people to see if we've moved the needle at all, one way or the other? And while we're waiting for that, I do want to um, reiterate for those participating that we will shortly have an opportunity for questions. I know there have been some discussions within the chat, and if they generate some questions, um, I can uh, try to throw them to our panelists and our panelists uh, will also have some other areas that which we might want to explore as a result of your questions. Um, if you raise a hand, we'll use a priority for that. So if you raise a hand using the Zoom platform, then uh, I can see you more easily and we can start with a question there. But if not, uh, we can also look at the chat. So thank you all. So my view on the poll is it seems like we had a lot of people, we don't have a lot of no's, which is different from what my experience has been in the United Kingdom. We have a lot of no's. Um, so I think you're maybe, I don't wanna say a more enlightened audience, but maybe it's something that because we already have uh, the Ontario Securities Commission and Canada Revenue Agency's OTIP programs, that maybe that's why there seems to be more of a, uh, an acceptance of of this model. Um, David, before we jump in, I know that Shaifali, I just wanted to pick up on one quick thing that Shaifali um, addressed and that I know Rhonda Starkman in the comments was discussing, which is that um, I think it's important to talk about what the rewards seek to do. I think they are, well, they're disserved by being called bounties and we try and, and move away from that because I don't think whistleblowers are pirates and they certainly aren't like a lottery ticket, a bounty that's unjustly given. What they seek to do is that the reprisal and retaliation laws only protect you as against that one employer. So that point on Shaifali's poll that talks about you worry about retaliation for against your by your current employer, the employer that you are um, basically exposing or bringing information about wrongdoing about, but it's the career blacklisting that that reprisal can't get at. Um, there are reprisal laws that are starting to expand and say that in addition to if, if future employers um, blacklist you, then you can still bring a claim under that. But I think the idea of the reward program is to put a financial safety net under people who, particularly in the financial services sector, often make six figures. Um, and that this is a, you know, my experience in 23 years has been that my clients don't do this for the money. They do this because they think it's wrong, but the money serves as a tipping point for them when they have to have those hard conversations with their spouses and family members and partners to say, I want to do the right thing, but I'm also our sole breadwinner and I don't want to be irresponsible. So it really, one author, Tom Muller, who's written sort of a definitive book on this published last year called um, Crisis of Conscience, Whistleblowing in an Age of Fraud, he has studied and you know, interviewed hundreds of whistleblowers and whistleblower lawyers and, you know, the founders of the False Claims Act and, and these other programs. And the idea is it's the net present value of a career loss. So I just sort of wanted to provide that context on what, what we see rewards as being. Thanks, Mary. That's very helpful. Um, one of the subjects that has been dealt with in the chat uh, already as the speakers were uh, sharing their experiences and their knowledge was the question of, of funding. Um, I know, for example, the federal, the Canadian federal legislation under the Public Service Disclosure Protection Act provides for a limited amount of funding for legal counsel in the case of persons who wish to disclose wrongdoing or who have a complaint alleging reprisal. Um, it, it's limited, I say, because it, 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 at the end of the day, if you were to proceed fully, it's probably insufficient, but it's better than nothing. And here we're talking about a system where, in many cases, people are undertaking disclosure at great risk, uh, and sometimes it could be at great cost. And I wonder if either of our panels ha have any comments on, on that. It's, it's interesting that I flagged this as an issue, perhaps, to, to discuss, and, and some of our 
attendees have flagged it as well. Um, I know, for example, that some firms, and Mary has, has pointed this out, uh, will do this kind of work on contingency. Uh, it's the same thing with, with myself. But even then, uh, we still need to have a good sense of what the case is about and what, it, what the risks are and what the chances of success are. So um, it, it's, it's, it's a proposition that's difficult for everybody. So I wonder if there are any thoughts from our panelists about that, about facilitating access at the end of the day, these programs look great on paper, but but how do we ensure that whistleblowers actually take the chance? And it is, I know that it's more than a chance, it's a significant risk uh, in terms of their personal and professional lives. Uh, but how can we facilitate that through funding uh, or other means? Maybe there are other means that, that we can think of. Mary or Shapali, any, any comments on that? I mean, I'm happy to jump in with that. Um, I think it's important to recognize that access to justice is a really vital um, issue and that we believe that the contingency fee success fee model does open up uh, basically free legal advice and you know at the initial stages right when people want to consult with a lawyer but are, are deterred by an hourly fee we can advise people right up front about whether they should go forward or not on a contingency fee basis so that is certainly the overwhelming majority of my colleagues in this space that's how we are reimbursed it is not a silver bullet um, because we are the contingency fee model should give you faith in the lawyers that you're talking to that they only want to invest case in cases that they think are going to win because otherwise they won't be reimbursed right so i like the model because our interests are aligned but it has limitations because um, the sec program for instance gets 6900 tips a year so i have to look at when those cases come in i have to tell my explain to my partners um you know do I really think this case is going to succeed? So it does tend to us taking and being more conservative and taking the more sure bets than the riskier bets. So it has its limitations. It's not perfect. And that's why I particularly enjoy being part of the conversations in the United Kingdom in the EU directive in Canada about a different approach where the EU directive is considering and Canada has already considered the notion that there should be um, in the short term, right? It can be a long time before you get that whistleblower reward if you get it. So what are we doing? What do we have underneath for infrastructure underneath the whistleblower to help them in the short term for psychosocial issues, but also to the point at issue um, attorneys. Um, so I think there should be a pool and I think it's, it, it's important that it be there and maybe that that is also for the you know, maybe the riskier cases, right? Because the ones that are sure bets are gonna, we're gonna, my firms and our competitors are gonna pick those up. So the question is, what about the ones that aren't as sure? My point on that is we will also pick up the not as sure ones. We're pretty creative. We have a financial motive here. We bring in experts. We help hire private investigators. We try and help find other whistleblowers who have that other piece of the puzzle. So I, I don't wanna say that we won't bring those because we do. It just takes, um, it takes more creativity and an investment of resources on our part, but we're willing to do that. So I just don't want there to be a false impression that we only take the, you know, the fully blown good ones because we don't. Um, and I think one of the biggest parts of the biggest develops, developments in the whistleblower space is that this, these programs, unlike the False Claims Act, allow multiple whistleblowers to come forward. The False Claims Act says, first whistleblower to the courthouse precludes all others, which I think is, um, is not a good policy because the SEC, the OSC programs recognize that the first one through the door may give you, you know, the direction to point you in, but subsequent whistleblowers can give you much more that helps you seal the deal or expand the fraud or other things. So I think um, that's one of the interesting parts. And so that if an individual whistleblower from inception can be paired with another whistleblower with a different vantage point within the same organization or out externally, that's a win-win. Let, let me add to that. So we, um, uh, in the OSC's whistleblower office, what we are is we are truly the advocate of the whistleblower. We, if should a whistleblower submit a tip to us, we will review the tip very carefully to determine if the tip warrants further review or investigation by the OSC. Under the OSC whistleblower program, whistleblowers can come to us without a lawyer. Um, they do not need a lawyer to submit a tip to our program. So whistleblowers can submit non-anonymously 
or should they wish to uh, not disclose their identity to us, they may hire a lawyer to come through our program. Um, the other aspect that I want to um, highlight is that um, we do have a hotline. So should whistleblowers have any questions about how to submit to our program or any specific questions on how our program works, we in the Office of the Whistleblower are happy to uh, speak with whistleblowers and provide any information. Um, this is a voluntary program. It's complimentary and there are no costs involved should whistleblowers wish to come and report misconduct to us. I also want to point out that, um, as I mentioned, uh, we have issued over 8 million in whistleblower awards since the inception of the OSC program. In some of those cases, the whistleblowers did not come in through a lawyer. So again, it really emphasizes the fact that, you know, whistleblowers can either come in through a lawyer or if they choose, they can come in um, non-anonymously uh, to our office and provide information. Um, in terms of helping out whistleblowers, what I would strongly encourage you to do is, should you have a tip involving securities misconduct in Ontario, we encourage you to provide those details, provide specific information on the alleged misconduct so that we can determine what the appropriate assessment of the tip should be. Uh, we encourage whistleblowers to provide any supporting documents that they may have, and you can upload those documents as part of your submission and submit it through the online portal. Um, Whistleblowers are not our agents, so we do not expect whistleblowers to go out and seek information that's not already in your possession. In those cases, we just ask that you identify those documents for us or, or you know, point us in the right direction, and then we will do our investigation to determine how best to obtain that information. So just generally, um, you know, uh, this is a voluntary program and we are trying to encourage whistleblowers to come forward and speak up and report the misconduct. Thank you much, uh, very much, Chef Ali. Uh, Mary, I, I know you, you just put on your microphone. Did you have something to add? I just, I did want to, I totally agree with Chef Ali's points and um, I think it is vital that we, we underline you don't need a lawyer unless you want to report anonymously. So, um, you know, obviously I'm a lawyer and I'm going to say there's a value add here. I can tell you there's a value add in the American programs when there's 6,900 tips um, and they're, they're sort of a victim of their own success. It does help to have replete players who have come forward and they trust to be bringing them high quality cases, but it's not necessary. But the thing I wanted to emphasize just sort of at the point of um, I share Shaifali's view 100% that we and the, the SEC program is, is mirrored to the OSC program that we will, we want people to report internally first. If, but it's not mandatory, right? And even the European whistleblower directive is structured this way because it will not always be possible to report internally. So that's why it's a plus factor. If you do report internally first, you'll get a higher end of your reward. Um, if you don't, it's a lower end, but the reason it's not uh, mandatory as a sort of a requirement to, for eligibility is because there'll be plenty of times in smaller institutions, particularly, where the people you're reporting to are part of the fraud. So I do feel like that's one of the things that sort of helps. Um, I do feel like advice from lawyers is really helpful and the best lawyers and as most of my colleagues and our competitors who've been in this field for a long time, we are here to protect whistleblowers. We will tell you, you have a viable claim here, but we will also say, should you bring it? Because there can be environments where it just doesn't make sense for you to bring that information internally, or maybe even to the OSC, because if it's so small, and even if you're anonymous, um, as to the OSC, the world may know because there were, it was a small institution and only three of you were involved in the de decision making. So I think it's really important because so much is at stake for the whistleblower in terms of the career blacklisting that the advice you need to get and you need to make sure that you're speaking to an attorney who has your best interests at heart. It isn't just pushing you to bring a claim for claim's sake because a lot of the time the right answer for our clients is you got a great claim but don't bring it. That's unfortunate, Mary, and that's that's always a difficult conversation to have. But I, I'm I am happy that the the 
idea of disclosing internally is not a requirement for these programs. And, and I think one of the most serious systemic barriers to whistleblowers raising concerns is that requirement because as you noted, Mary, in many cases, raising in inter something internally is essentially a death sentence as far as your, your job prospects go for the future. So requiring that is, is really counterproductive. Um, there's, there, there are a few questions that have come up in the chat, and I think this is something that Shaifali may be able to answer, but the, the CoinSquare case that you talked about uh, from last summer, obviously a, an important case for you and, and for the program. Um, the, was there a, a particular whistleblower and, and, and what happened with the whistleblower? Were they compensated or can you tell us about uh, that part of the process in that case? Thank you. Um, so as I mentioned, the CoinSquare case was a key case for the OSC because it really, I think, sent a strong message um, to the market saying that we will take enforcement action against those employers who take reprisals against employee whistleblowers. Um, in order to protect the confidentiality and integrity of our investigations, I cannot comment on this matter. Um, what I can say is that, uh, you know, uh, generally, um, when there are whistleblower awards that are issued, you'll note from our previous press releases that we do not identify in the press release the whistleblower. We also do not identify the enforcement matter that resulted in the whistleblower. So again, this is to protect the uh, confidentiality of, of uh, our investigations, but also to protect the whistleblower. Um, confidentiality is key, and we always have to be very mindful that you know, we wouldn't want a whistleblower to face any negative consequences as a result of our public announcement. So this is something that uh, uh, we always keep in mind when announcing whistleblower awards. Thanks, Sha Shavali. That's, that's very helpful. Um, in, 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 in broader terms, I know there have been some questions here about uh, success uh, in these programs. And I'm wondering whether either of Shafali or Mary can, can speak to that. Um, you know, broadly speaking, we are debating or discussing the practice of giving a reward to a whistleblower who discloses something that results in a, in a financial savings. Um, I think those of us who are involved in this area of work or practice um, like that because it should act as an incentive. But as a practical matter, are, are either of you seeing real results? And I think, Mary, you have probably more expertise in that um, than anybody just looking at the U.S. history that you've already done. But is it is it effective? Is this kind of incentive effective at the end of the day? Yeah, and it's a great question. And Carol, thank you for asking it. Um, so it, it, the question, it, we beg the question when we talk about, I keep saying there's 6,900 tips, but they've only paid out under the SEC 143 whistleblowers, right? So that doesn't seem like a great return. So that is a criticism that has been appropriately leveled at the SEC. And I'm pleased to report that they have taken on board that criticism. And in September of last year, new uh, amendments were passed to the enacting rules for the whistleblower program under Dodd-Frank. And one of the things, the biggest sort of quantum leap that they made in terms of a change is that so many of these, it was from the time that a fine was imposed, some whistleblowers were experiencing waits. So, right, right, they've been vindicated. The information they gave resulted in a fine and now they're sitting waiting up to five years um, for a decision to be made um, about what amount of that reward they should receive. Um, I am sympathetic to the SEC and the OSC here because sometimes it's difficult when you have multiple whistleblowers, they have to figure out, you know, among those four who reported in what percentage, you know, who is really eligible, who did we really rely on. So it does take time. Um, but I think what the SEC experienced is that they have now created new rules to more effectively process those kind of process the awarding of complaint of, of the awarding of creation of giving awards to whistleblowers, and they now have experienced a 300% fold increase in the amount that they are awarding. Um, so the numbers, it's literally every week or every other week we've seen the SEC now um, announcing awards. It's at an unprecedented pace. And the reason they're able to do this is they've done one or two things that are critical. They have said that the majority, they've looked at their data, the majority of awards to whistleblowers under the SEC are $5 million or less. 
So for those, rather than trying to figure out and, and, and engage in all the resources of figuring out, do you get 10, do you get 30%, how do we do it? Mandatory, unless there's a negative factor present, mandatory 30%. That has gone a long way to freeing up their resources to put these awards out. So um, that is probably one of the biggest changes and it's already, we're seeing the impacts of that greatly. Um, but I think this is problem, part of the problem is that I, I can't speak to, I don't know how many of the 6,900 are, um, are legitimate, but I can tell you the other thing that they've experienced is that as soon as an award is announced under the SEC, right? So they, they have imposed a fine, whistleblowers come out of the woodwork, even ones who didn't. <laughs> so they now have a three strikes you're out rule um, that just basically says, I'm sorry, you can't keep, every time there's a ward, you can't keep showing up and taking our resources. So they are, they're working on it. Um, but I don't really have hard data for you beyond the fact that, you know, I can tell you um, because of the confines that we have at Shaifali that are very important, that we want to protect the sine qua non is you have to protect these whistleblowers in order for um, them to come forward to you. You can't connect the dots between the whistleblowers and the successes, but there are a few whistleblowers who have come up, become public and have been dropped the mask of anonymity. Um, and so we've seen they've been vitally important in the foreign exchange rate manipulation cases. Um, so some really huge frauds taking place in, in banks, chat rooms and banks across Europe and the United States. We know that there were whistleblowers here. There's a whistleblower by the name of Ted Sedell, an investment advisor in the model of Harry Markopoulos, who's not an insider, but exposed JP Morgan and received a $40 million award from the SEC, $30 million from the CFTC, because he, in advising his pension fund clients, saw that JP Morgan was directing um, people to proprietary offerings that were not in the client's best interest. So basically putting their interests above their clients and breaching fiduciary duties. So um, that's just a few examples. So I, I have seen people whistleblowers be incredibly impactful, um, but it's hard to pick behind the curtain because by, by definition, we can't look at a lot of this stuff because we can't connect the dots because we need to protect those whistleblowers. Thanks, Mary. There's a question I'm going, going to get to in, in a second, but um, one of the, you, you, you touched on this a little bit already, but one of the stats you referred to, I thought was quite, quite striking. And that is that uh, pre Dodd-Frank, the whistleblower program handed out uh, 100, almost $160,000 to whistleblowers from 1989 to 2010. And then since 2010, it's been $759 million, uh, that's post Dodd-Frank. And is that just the result of the, the scope of activity that's now uh, available to be used for uh, the program or are there other factors that are involved there in, in that increase? I think the singular factor is that before Dodd-Frank, it was discretionary at the complete and total discretion of the SEC whether to give an award and whistleblowers hate uncertainty, right? Are you going to risk take, under, undergo all of these risks um, just for the hope that they will look kindly upon you. Um, so I think that has been the data that we've seen time and time again is in the IRS program similarly, and even now the anti-money laundering programs, all of them had discretionary ones that have been completely underutilized. Um, it has been something that gives the certainty to a whistleblower to feel like it's worth my undertaking the risk and the risk reward calculus if they have to undergo. Thank you, uh, Shafali, Mary, and, and David for moderating this. Um, and thank you everyone for uh, attending. I don't know if you each have a last word of wisdom or something you wanted to uh, conclude with, but I just want to say thank you for attending and I'll see you at uh, new activities of Whistleblowing Canada. Thank you, Paloma. I, my only word of wisdom is, is to emphasize that as an additional name for whistleblowers, a lot of people advising businesses in social behavioral science prefer the term forward indicators of risk. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think we need to start thinking in that way because it speaks business speak, that it shows that, and this is this research that we can point out to you for, from professors Kyle Welch and Steven Steubens, it says companies that have whistleblower hotlines that are actively ringing um, have fewer lawsuits, fewer investigations, and the lawsuits they do have settle for less than those who have silent um, whistleblower hotlines. 
So more to my point of whistleblowers are a CEO's best friend. They are forward indicators of risk. So trying to change not just the view that, you know, Shaifali is already convinced, the OSC is already convinced they're helpful. We need to convince the companies that they're helpful. And so we like to use business speak to do that. So let's start calling them forward indicators of risk. Shaifali, anything to add from you? Yes, thank you. Um, yes, thanks again to the Whistleblowing Canada Research Society for having me here. I hope that you all found the presentation to be helpful. Um, I just want to encourage all of you to vi visit the Whistleblower website at oscwhistleblower.ca, which has lots of information on the Whistleblower program. It has practical tips to help whistleblowers who may be considering making a tip to the regulator, and it also serves as the online portal should you wish to make a tip. Thanks, Shefali, and, and, and thank you to both uh, Mary and Shefali for taking the time. Uh, I know you're both busy, but your presentations have been excellent. It's very useful. And I think this webinar was great. I love the series of webinars now that the Research Society is doing. It's amazing to continue this, this discussion. It's a really, uh, it, it's still a new area of law developing. And so the more we talk about it, I think the better it will be and, and sharing problems across jurisdiction, especially and solutions is, is really awesome. So thanks uh, for putting this on and I look forward to the next one. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Thanks Paloma, thanks Pam for having us. Thank you everyone, thank you.